Well, it's a joy to be here, and uh, we'll get straight down to business. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 through 2. I want to speak this morning on the subject, don't stop now. There's always that temptation to give up, uh, to be turned from that course that God has set before you, uh, to allow the obstacles to become too big, to overcome your faith and uh, your commitment. And so I want to encourage you uh, to borrow words from uh, Eugene Peterson. I want to encourage you to uh, long obedience in the same direction, because that's what the Christian life is. And, and the writer to the Hebrews points that out here as he calls us to run the race with endurance. He calls us to long obedience in the same direction. Would you follow along in God's Word? I'm reading from the New King James translation of Holy Scripture. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God and on the throne of God. So reads God's word, don't stop now. One of my favorite stories surrounding the uh, Irish Rebellion of 1916 centers on uh, Eamon de Valera, who would ultimately become the first prime minister of the Irish Republic. And in his fight for freedom and independence from the British, uh, he gave a fiery speech in a little town called Innes around the time of the rebellion. He was stoking up the fire of rebellion against the British presence in Ireland. And uh, the British forces were there, and as he stirred the crowd up, he was arrested. And the British thought they'd cool him down a little bit, this, this Irish hothead, and so they threw him in jail for a little bit, hoping that he would kind of cool his jets a bit. Uh, several months later, he's released, and according to the story I read, he goes back to the town of Ennis, goes to the town center, stands where he had once been, where he was arrested. The crowd gathers. And the first words out of his mouth are these words, as I was saying before I was interrupted. <laughs> they certainly didn't cool him down. This was a guy committed to his cause. This was a guy who exemplified long obedience in the same direction. He wasn't going to be put off his game. He wasn't going to be shut up. He wasn't going to be turned back from what he believed to be uh, a worthy purpose and pursuit in his life. And he's um, an example of perseverance, isn't he? Certainly in this situation, a political cause. Here's a man willing to run with endurance the race that was set before him politically and nationally. And you know what? We, we need to embrace that call ourselves as Christians. Uh, and and it's, it's not easy in a culture that likes to travel the path of least resistance. Ours is a society that looks for the easy way out. In, in the face of unwanted pregnancy, we kill our unborn. That's the easy way out. Faced with a marriage that's going in the wrong direction, we like to quickly turn around and head for the divorce courts, the easy way out. Even on the spiritual side of things, some of us might find ourselves in a ministry situation that's going to cost us more than we ever anticipated, and so we resign, feeling uh, perhaps in life that our felt needs are not being met. We are willing to violate the standards of God. It, it's so easy to step onto the path of least resistance. It's easy for me. It's easy for you, it's easy for us. It's a challenge to, to uh, give yourself and commit yourself to long obedience in the same direction. Uh, we are, a, as the church, a counterculture in the culture. And so rather than looking for the easy way out, the, the Christian is someone who's willing to work through difficulties. 
willing to bear heavy loads for a sustained period of time, willing to hang in there and, and work through a problem to a better day. And then certainly as we come to Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 2, this, this quality of long obedience in the same direction is what the writer is exhorting these Hebrew Christians to do because they were right now being tempted to take the easy way out. You go back to Hebrews 10, uh, because of their faith in Jesus Christ, they had been disinherited. Friends had turned their back on them. Businessmen had lost contracts. Their houses had been plundered. Some of them had been hauled off to prison. This, this is the price they were paying for commitment to Jesus Christ. And they, they thought to themselves, you know why? Why, why don't we just go back to um, Judaism? That's easier. And the writer says, you can't do that. Don't, don't be doing that. We, we've already made an argument, haven't we, that the old covenant's been replaced by the new covenant? A greater than Moses has come in the person of Jesus Christ. Talk about the temple. Well, he's the presence of God tabernacling among us. Talk about priesthoods and sacrifices. Well, he's after the priesthood of Melchizedek. His, his an eternal priesthood. He offered the one true and final sacrifice for sin forever and sat down at the right hand of God. I mean, given the blazing sun that Jesus Christ is, would you go back to the flickering candle of Judaism? Don't. And, and here it all kind of comes to a crescendo. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance that race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So, if you're taking notes, there's several things I see in the text that will help us not to stop, that will encourage us to long obedience in the same direction. Number one, first of all, what I see and what I call the encouragement recorded, the encouragement recorded, that this call to run with endurance is encouraged in the face of the legacy of faith and enduring commitment that was exemplified by the Old Testament saints. You, you'll notice that the, the passage we're looking at, chapter 12, begins with therefore. And the old preachers would always say, when you see therefore, ask yourself the question, what's it there for? And it's therefore to build a bridge. It's therefore to, to, to announce a transition from chapter 11 to chapter 12. It, it, it's um, reminding us that uh, if we, we are to hold fast our confession of faith in, in the light of the fact that there were others behind us that held fast to their confession of faith. Hebrews 12 verse 1 encourages them to run hard and hold fast against the backdrop of Old Testament saints whose lives witness to the value and blessing of living by faith. Uh, Hebrews 11 is what's been called the Westminster Abbey of faith. And we have the stories of Abraham and Noah and Enoch and, 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 and um, Moses and others, the just who lived by faith. And they exemplified an, an enduring faith and a costly faith and an expectant faith. And, and their story speaks to us. And, and it's meant to help us write a new chapter in our story of faithfulness, greater perseverance. And here's the image. The image is an athletic one, isn't it? Run the race with endurance. So the image is of the runner on the track running the race, and around him in the stadium are all the spectators, all the witnesses who, are, who, who cheer the runners on. I, I love sports. I've been to some of the great stadiums of the world. It's something to be in the Stratford end in Old Trafford, watching Manchester United. I've been there several times, and the crowd's going crazy. Rocking to and fro, shouting. They're, they're like the 12th man. I've been 
to uh, the horseshoe several times with my beloved Buckeyes and watch them play college football. 109,000 screaming fans. You know, that, that's a shot of adrenaline, isn't it? If you're a player. And we know that the Seattle fans call themselves the 12th man up there when the Seahawks are playing. And that's the image that these Old Testament saints witness to the New Testament saints and tell them to, you know what, keep putting that one foot in front of that other foot. Don't stop now. And by the way, we've got to clear something up. Is the implication here that they're actually watching in real time what's going on in the life of these Hebrews? I don't think so. I think it is that their faith witnesses to these young Christians not to give up on their faith in Jesus Christ. Because they endured not seeing the fulfillment of the promise. These New Testament believers have lived to see the promise, and they are to keep going in the light of that. And you know what? Their faith speaks to us, doesn't it? When you're facing a family issue or a family problem, you might want to study Abel, who had a brother that hated him. If you're making a cross-country move, you might want to study Abraham who left his homeland and went out not knowing where God was taking him. At least you know where you're going, but it's still a challenge to leave the familiar for the unfamiliar. Read Abraham and his faith. Have you ever been bitterly wounded? Then read Joseph and how he overcame the hatred of his brothers. You're making a costly decision for the kingdom? Then read Moses who gave up the riches of Egypt and embraced the reproach that would come with identifying with God's people. Are you, are you attempting something big for God? Some, something like crazy? Like, like building a boat in the middle of the desert like Noah? All their stories speak to our story, telling us to write a new chapter of faithfulness. So, so here you have the encouragement recorded, their, their lives speak into to our lives. Love the story in the time of the Renaissance, the, the great artist Leonardo da Vinci was painting one of his masterpieces on the canvas. He had toiled on it for weeks. He had, he had brought the right perspective. He had used the right hues and colors to, to make the picture pop. It, it was close to completion when all of a sudden, after weeks of working on it, he steps back and he hands the brush to one of his young artists and says, you finish it. Well, you can imagine, he kind of steps back. He says, I'm not gonna put my stroke to the master's stroke. But here's what Leonardo da Vinci says to him when he's hesitant to take up that challenge. Will not what I have done inspire you to do your best? And, and it seems that's the message that comes out of Hebrews 11. Will not what we have done in the just living by faith in the old covenant inspire you to do your best in the new covenant? We, we lived by a promise. You've come to see the fulfillment of that promise. You're living on the other side of the cross and the virgin birth and the perfect life and the physical resurrection. So there's the encouragement recorded. Secondly, I call what I call the encumbrance rejected because he goes on, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, so the runner on the track, the witnesses in the stadium, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance. Okay? So the runner's running, the crowd's cheering. Well, let's pause and rewind the tape a little bit. Got to go back to the start of the race on this idea. Because when you go to the start of the race, you can be sure that the runners that are getting into the running blocks waiting for the start of the race, they're stripped down to the bare minimum. In fact, History tells us the Olympic and the Greek runners ran virtually naked. They didn't want anything to stop them. 
They, they, they dieted, they, they went onto a strict regimen to drop body fat, to get their, their, their phys- physical form lean and mean. And then they didn't want any clothes flopping, uh, getting in the way. That's the image. And even today we see that, don't we? I mean, you, you, you watch the runners today, they're, they're almost, the, the new outfits they're wearing is almost like a sack in skin. They're lean and mean. They don't want anything to use that old word to encumber them or to hinder them or to stop them. And so we move from the encouragement recorded to the encumbrance rejected. And the implication is to us on the spiritual side, as you said about pursuing Christ and being a follower of his and a disciple of his, and you seek to commit yourself to long obedience in the same direction, then, then set aside anything that gets in the way that, that doesn't allow you to fully embrace Christ, to fully enjoy him, to fully know him. And so, young people, there's, there's two things. Did you notice the text? Lay aside, okay? We'll rewind the tape. We're at the beginning of the race. Then they'll start the race. The crowd will cheer. Lay aside every weight and sin. There's, there's two things that have got to be set aside. Weights and sins. And then you, you, let me help you kind of make that distinction. A weight is, is, is something that's not necessarily bad, but it can be bad in terms of getting in the way of fully pursuing Christ. So what's, here's the way I'm defining a weight. A weight is the good that can become bad. Okay, so get that idea. The weight is the good that can become bad. Then the sin is the bad that can never be good. It's always off limits. It's always forbidden. So, so let's unpack this. So let's talk about the good that can be bad, the weight. See, the weight is something that's not bad in and of itself, but it can work against the best. Good for someone else, good for another time, but not good for you at this time, given your pursuit of Jesus Christ. And and I think it's fascinating. It's something you need to learn. I had to learn. We all need to learn that sometimes the biggest challenge in the Christian life is not deciding between the bad and the good. It's deciding between the good and the best. And we're not too good at that. We're too busy working on this side. You know, I don't want to sin. I I, I don't want to do that because it's forbidden in God's word. That's great. But that's only half the game. Part of the game is to say, you know what? That's good. That's wholesome. That's not forbidden in God's word. That's a liberty I could enjoy. But you know what? I've got a higher goal in life. And that really can become a weight, can become an impediment. Isn't that what Paul makes an argument about it in 1 Corinthians 10, 23. What does he say? All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. And that's a passage about eating meat to idols and all of that. I'm not going to get in. I want to stick, stick, stick big picture. He's simply saying, there are things that I could do because they're lawful, but I don't always do them because they're not always expedient. They're not always profitable. It's not always the best thing I could do. Fascinating, isn't it? If you want another verse to look at, go to Philippians 1, 9 to 10, where Paul prays for the Philippians, and one of the things he prays, that they might approve that which is excellent. What an interesting little phrase. Here's what he prays for them. I pray that they'd not only turn from sin, and they'd never give themselves to that which is forbidden and lawful. I pray that God would give them discernment to pursue the best, the excellent, the noble. Listen, just because something's not a sin doesn't make it right in your life or my life. That's a challenging thought. Maybe that's the one thing you want to think about as you leave chapel today. Just because something's not a sin doesn't mean it's right, doesn't mean you should do it. Or as Sinclair Ferguson said at a chapel at the Masters University I was present in, just because you have a liberty doesn't mean you should take that liberty. In fact, part of the liberty is having the liberty not to enjoy the liberty. 
Did you follow that? It's a great thought. I, I, I left that chapel that day going, wow, that's interesting. I might have liberty to do that, but I've also liberty not to do it because it's a liberty. And given a set of circumstances, given my pursuit of Christ, given the danger of being enslaved even to good things, I might not just do that. It might be an act of self-denial, which is a good thing because that promotes cross-bearing in my life. Athletes discipline themselves, and, and we need to do the same. Look, young people think this through for the sake of time. Some of those areas would be entertainment. Some of those areas would be sports, politics, hobbies, friendships. To, if it was an older crowd, I'd say retirement. Retirement's a good thing, but it also can become a very self satisfying thing outside the kingdom of God. And so there's all kinds of areas, all kinds of choices we face. That's why one old writer said, when it comes to making our choices, you need to ask a simple question. Is it a weight or is it a wing? Love that. Is this thing a weight, a hindrance to my discipleship? Or is it a wing? Does it lift me up? Does it push me towards Christ? Is it a weight or is it a wing? You know, I just, I'm just back from a, a week in Israel with about 100 people in, in our church. And you know what? I, I did the same thing I've always done. I've over, I overpacked. I don't know if that's your problem, but I overpack. You young people are great at just throwing stuff in a bag in the overhead bin and off you go. But us old folks, man, we're, we're weighed down with these 50-pound cases. You know, we get seven or eight outfits for like a three-day trip. And, and, and it was the same, I, I, I you know, maxed out my, my weight limit for the plane. I go down to LAX, always a little worried, well, 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 will I get, you know, penalized? Because I'm always on the edge, 49, 51. I'm always playing the game. And, and then when I go abroad, it's so full, if I buy myself something, I got to buy a sack and bag to bring it home in. And then when I get home and open that case again, I realize I didn't wear half this stuff. Weight. It's not evil. I mean, that second pair of jeans isn't evil. But just wait. Not evil, but not essential. Could have done with one pair. And so often in life, we overpack. We're hucking around luggage. It's not evil, but not essential. It's getting in the way of us pursuing Christ. Then the second thought is the bad that cannot be good. The bad that cannot be good. We've got to lay aside the weight, and we've got to lay aside the sin. Well, this is a lot easier, right? Anything that violates the Ten Commandments, forbidden. You don't even go in that direction. Anything that looks like the sins of the flesh, Galatians 5, you don't go near it. That's the sin. But here's what's interesting. He talks about the sin that's so easily ensnares us, or I like the old King James, I grew up on it, besets us. And there's this kind of language that's now part of our kind of evangelical lingo, the besetting sin. Those sins that easily trip us up, those, those sins we keep going back to, those sins that maybe we pursued with a venom before we got saved and we're having to deal with kind of the, 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 the overhang of that in our new life in Christ. Or perhaps it's the prevailing sins of the society that makes that sin easier, i.e. pornography, a besetting sin of many because it's been made easy in society. It can be anonymous, it can be accessed, and it's cheap. And, and, and those are the things we need to think through and, 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 and fight against because they war against us and our pursuit of Christ. You've got to lay them aside. You've got to get up every day like the runner who's on that track for the, the, the Olympics two years from now, and they're committed to a regimen of self-discipline, sacrifice, hard work. They're going to lay aside. They're not going to do that which they could do because it's not good in the pursuit of what's best. And certainly, there's things they're not going to do because it's evidently not good. 
So you need to guard your life in those areas. You need to know what some of those besetting sins are, where you're vulnerable, where the enemy likes to set up his attack. Before I went into the ministry, I spent six years in the Royal Ulster Constabulary. Although I began the sermon with the story about an Irish Republican, I'm an Ulster loyalist. And so for a time, I fought the new IRA and I worked out in North Belfast, and one of the favorite weapons of the IRA was a mortar bomb. They homemade mortars. They would get tubes, metal tubes. They'd weld them to a base plate. They'd attach a firing mechanism, and they would put them on a low bed uh, truck and drive them to a particular place where they could fire them into our stations. One particular attack killed 15 officers in a town called Newry. And so after that, we set about what was called the mortar bomb patrol. In every station, we had the British Army survey where, where we were vulnerable, because most of our stations, at least in Belfast where I was, were in built-up areas. There was only so many places, maybe a play park or a school car lot or whatever. And so there was maybe seven or eight of these. And if we had intelligence that the IRA was setting up to attack us, we would be on the mortar bomb patrol. And we would just go for the whole night shift systematically to those places that we knew we were vulnerable and make sure that they weren't setting up for an attack. And you know what? That's a, our stations knew where we were vulnerable. We worked that out. And, and, and there's so many Christians haven't worked out yet those areas where they're most vulnerable, those besetting sins that so easily ensnare us and impede us in our walk with God. Here's another thought as we move on, the endurance required. Not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's really at the heart of of what we've already said in so many, many ways. So so you lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares you and, and run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look, it almost... Bear's not saying, but it must be said, the Christian life is, a, is not a Sunday afternoon stroll in the park. It's an agonizing pursuit of Christ. It's warfare. It, it, it's competitive athletics. That's the image. Any theology that gives you the impression that there's some easy path to sanctification, you need to close the book on that theology. Because you've got to run with endurance. The Greek word is is a word that gives us our English word, agonize. You've got to run agonizingly. No one ever won an Olympics eating donuts, (laughs) sleeping in, binge drinking, running in boots. No, it took years of self-discipline, agonizing pain to get there, to to, to slice that nanosecond that will make the difference at the end of the race. And that's the picture, folks. Is that you and me? I mean, just look over the past week or two of your walk with God. Could you say it's been marked by agonizing pursuit of Christ? Or are you just fluffing off, breezing through Biola? Not that serious about your discipleship, for Jesus Christ. That, that's the challenge here. This is to be marked by a strenuous effort. And, and the point I want to just underscore for a moment is it's a singular effort. Do, do notice the words. This is the, the one kind of new angle I don't want you to miss. Let us run with endurance. Let us run agonizingly the race that is set before us. Okay, back to the stadium. All right? Runner, lay it aside anything that gets in the way. They're off. Crowds cheering. And here's the other point. They're in their lane. They're running the race set before them. And you and I need to take that that, that picture and realize that our Christian life's to be marked by strenuous effort and singular effort. We've, We've got to get our eyes off the other runners. We're not in competition with them. That's why Jesus will rebuke Peter, right? Uh, You told me how I'm going to die. What about John? And what does Jesus say? Well, let me tell you, Peter, how John's going to die. He doesn't. He says, mind your own business, boy. Mind your own business. You you run your race. You stay in your lane. John's got a different race. 
His race will end differently from your race. He'll end his race as an old man pastoring the church at Ephesus. You're going to die in martyrdom. Run the race set before you. Guys, we're not in competition with each other. We've got to get jealousy out of the ministry. We've got to get competitiveness out of the church. And you've got to pursue Christ as God has gifted you and called you. Hebrews 2 verse 10, right? The works which he has ordained for you to do. We've all got different spiritual gifts. I gotta avoid getting into it, just throw it out your way. I haven't truly bought into this idea, just love God and do what you want. I haven't bought into Gary Friesen's understanding of the will of God completely. I, I, I think he's doing a good thing, I think he's striking at a good goal, but surely just even the issue of spiritual gifts means that God's will for you and God's will for me are completely different. It's not enough just to say love God and do what you want. I've got to discover my spiritual and natural bents and I've got to determine what particular path God wants me to take. And you've got to do that and what wonderful opportunity you have here at Biola to do it. Not every Christian like you gets to enjoy this. They're off in secular universities getting hammered every day and their faith's getting challenged every day. And in some ways, that's a good thing. But you get to send under godly professors, come to chapel, read theology, read Christian biography. And you should be determining what God wants to do with you, just like Warren Wearsby. I, I love Warren Wearsby. He wrote a series of comedies called the B series, and so when he brought it, when he wrote his own autobiography, I bought it, and it was called what? Well, if he wrote a whole series of books called the B series, you would expect his autobiography to be what it was: "Be yourself." And he talks about how early on he realized he had a bent to read and study, and he had a passion to read and study and preach the word of God. His brother was a, an athletic jock and while well, he was down, you know, pounding the paint or, or on the, the gridiron, Warren was over in the local library curled up in front of a book. And he didn't feel intimidated by that. That was his brother and that was him. And he learned to be himself. In fact, he says this, that he was at a Youth for Christ event once and he shared with Terry Johnson what God was calling him to do, to go to Bible college and preach the gospel. And here's what Johnson said, which changed his life. Young man, find the one thing you do that God blesses and stick with it. It's a good word. Time's gone, last thought would be what? The example recommended. <laughs> Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Um, we're back to the stadium. Crowd, cheering, going bananas. The runners laid aside anything that's going to impede them. Now they're, they're, they're in full stride. They're, they're, they're the sweat and the muscles are straining. It's agonizing, but it's glorious. And the one other picture left here in Hebrews 12 is there's a royal box. In fact, when we were in Israel just a week or two ago, we went to Caesarea by the sea, and we actually were in a half of a stadium that was left over from the time of Pontius Pilate and the time of Christ. And, and the, the Jewish guide pointed us to a raised box. You could see the outline of a box. It was the royal box. And the point is, the runners or the charioteers, whatever was going on in, in that stadium, and time, at some point, they'd come past the royal box and they'd give an eye to the king. It's one thing for all, all the, the, the spectators to be cheering, but what about the smile or the wink of the king? And that's the final thought. And, and in some ways, not to take away all that he has said, here's, but here's what he's saying as we close. Don't be preoccupied with what hinders you. Don't be overwhelmed by the course before you. And don't make too much of the witnesses around you. Make sure you're fixed on Christ, the author and finisher of your faith as you seek to finish your faith. And that's a wonderful challenge. We've got to spend each day pursuing Christ who is greater than Moses, who established the new covenant in his blood, who made the one sacrifice for sin who's now in heaven for us, the great high priest. 
who's touched with the feelings of our infirmity. When we get weak in the race, he understands he himself got weak in Gethsemane and prayed for grace to embrace the race that was set before him. And the Hebrew writer says, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And and, and folks, here's the encouragement as I might finish with this. I've talked a lot about examples, and we've got the example of the Old Testament, we've got the example of Christ, but shining examples can be frustrating, can't they? I mean, what an example of soccer skill is Lionel Messi, best in the world, better than Ronaldo as far as I'm concerned. And I, and I played soccer for a while. I stopped it a while ago because I realized I was taking painkillers before the game and I realized it was time to finish it. But when I watch Messi, I, I get inspired and then I get frustrated. If this is what, it's, this is what it means to play soccer, count me out. He's too good. It's almost frustrating to watch him. See him with golf. You know, you watch a Rory McIlroy or a Spieth, brilliant. You get inspired to get your clubs and get back out there. See if you can break 100. <laughs> and then you go, hold on a minute. If this is what it means to play golf, what, what, why am I even trying? Never going to get there. But that's the beauty about Christ, looking on to Jesus, who's not only before us, but by the presence of the Holy Spirit is within us the paracletos, who's come alongside to strengthen us in the race. So let's look to Christ by the spiritual means of prayer and and disciplines of studying the word and journaling and being with God's people on the Lord's day so that indeed he might pour his strength into us so that we might exemplify that long obedience in the same direction. David Brainard used to pray, Lord, help me not to loiter on my way to heaven. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.